So this is the plan for this clinic. Any questions so far? All right, I really encourage you guys to ask me questions. I love discussing things and talking about things. Feel free to raise your hand and tell me I'm wrong, things like that. I love arguing, in a good way, though. All right, so first of all, the grand vision. All right, so, oh, wait, my notes. I had some carefully chosen words for this, so I want to make sure that I uh, justice. All right, so the idea behind WMT and CMT before it is that we want to be, uh, develop a framework for modeling that lets you assemble components to uh, model and predict uh, you know, transport and deposition of water, sediment, and other nutrients over uh, terrestrial surfaces, and as well as how these surfaces evolve over a range of spatial and temporal scales. Uh, this framework should uh, empower users to answer science questions. Yeah, I think this is what Irina will be showing. Uh, the framework should streamline the process from idea to implementation. It should also be inclusive, modular, and user-friendly. Right, so this is the big idea behind this tool. So what was our goal in trying to rewrite CMT? What, what was the purpose behind WMT? The idea is that we wanted to make a, a web-based tool to do component modeling. Why? Right, I've got four reasons here. And, and these are broad things. I'll try to flesh them out. So first of all, accessibility. So WMT, you'll see, runs on a web browser, all you need. You don't need to worry about what Java version you have. You know, does that Java version run on the Mac or does it run on Windows? What's a JRE? All right, all you need is a web browser. Next, integration. Uh, you know, James made a point this morning about being able to link to the documentation and the help for a model so that we don't have models that are black boxes. Well, WMT is a web page. I can make links to other web pages like those on the system's website. Third, portability. So because WMT is basically a web application, it works on a web browser, not on an operating system. So I don't care if you're using Linux or Mac OS X or Windows. You know, all you need is a web browser. It doesn't matter if you're on your desktop, if you're on your laptop, if you're on a tablet, if you're on a phablet, if you're on a phone, you can use WMT. And last, maintenance. So the nice thing about this, uh, because uh, web standards exist and they are standards, um, we have only need to develop one version of WMT. We don't have to worry about these operating system dependencies. Uh, there are a few browser dependencies. I just, rec I just found one in Firefox yesterday. But there's a lot less than having browser depend or than having operating system dependencies. All right, so this is our objective in creating WMT. All right, next, the implementation. And again, I know this isn't terribly exciting for many of you, but I want to show this because it, it, it can lend insight into how we built it. So WMT is a RESTful web application. What does that mean? Uh, REST is a representational, representational state. What's the last T? I can't remember the last T. Can anybody help me with that? We can Wikipedia it. Representational state transfer. I'm trying to get you guys to help me out a little bit here. All right, so REST is a, a software architecture paradigm. The idea behind REST is that there are uh, features, some key features of it. And I put these in my standard separation, stateless, simple, and secure. I was very happy with that. I could alliterate that so nicely. So with REST, you get a separation between the client and the uh, application programming interface. All right, so I've got a diagram here. I'm going to dive into the diagram a little bit in just a little bit. But let me, first of all, talk a little bit more about these properties of REST that we are using in WMT. So, separation between the client and the programming interface, uh, the separation of concerns. Uh, REST is stateless. 
So uh, information about the, the model you're developing, for example, in WMT is held in the client. All right, so if the client goes away, then your model goes away. But the nice thing is you save stuff and it goes to the server. Um, the, the communication between the client and the server uh, goes through standard HTTP get and post method calls. Uh, information is communicated with JSON. So it's kind of neat because it's a very lightweight way of transferring information. It's just text. It's a couple bytes at a time when we make communication between the client and the server. It's also here. We use HTTP so your, your passwords won't be compromised. All right, so let me delve a little bit further into the uh, diagram because I want to talk a little bit more about our application and uh, of this RESTful interface and uh, how it works currently at Systems. I should mention, you know, uh, one example of a RESTful web application is the internet, is the web, w, the www. That's a RESTful application, actually. All right, that's an aside. Okay, so what we have with WMT is we have a client. The client is just your going to be your browser. So again, a browser on any sort of platform. All right, the browser communicates through the internet, again, with these HTTP calls, with a server. Okay, now the server I've broken up, and actually uh, using uh, Eric's explanation to me, uh, I've broken this up into three components. The database server, the execution server, and the data server. So the, the database server, the idea, what it does is it contains uh, information about the components that you would use to assemble a model in WMT. It contains the, mo the metadata about the models that you would develop, uh, as well as simulations that you'd run. Uh, the database server is sort of the controller as well. This is what you talk to between the client and the server. The database server will then, you know, if you want to execute a simulation, it'll pass that metadata over to the execution server. So the execution server is where the model is actually run. This could be, well, for example, right now that is Beach, our, our, our HPCC. Uh, in the future, this could be maybe a really sweet new Mac Pro, for example. Those are pretty fast. All right, but this is the execution server. This is where the simulation is actually run. So it needs to have computa the computational ability to run a model. It needs to hold the, the system software stack. You know, so the, the, the CCA tool chain, uh, the systems framework tools, as well as the, share, the compiled shared libraries for the components. So again, this right now currently is Beach, but it could be a, a personal computer, it could be Janus, it could be, as you know, James mentioned this morning, it could be Yellowstone, for example. Um, so, and then lastly, the data server. So when the execution server completes the simulation run, it will post information, it will post the output to the data server, where the user can then pick it up. So right now, the execution server, as I mentioned, is Beach. The database server and the data server are River. Is that right, Eric? Okay, good. So the database server and data server are both River right now. So it's our, our main computer at systems back at CU. But again, this WMT could be deployed elsewhere as well. So we have an instance of WMT, if you will. All right. uh, our source code is up on GitHub as well. So you can uh, browse the code, you can download it, you can make fun of the bad code that I wrote. Oh, it was really good code, don't worry. All right. So it's shareable. All right, any questions, any comments on that? Okay. All right, well, let's take a look at the client. So this is the overall right now for our instance of, w, of WMT. Note that it uses you know, secure HTTP. All right, so if you'd like, please enter this in your browser. What kind of browsers are you guys using? Who's using Chrome? Who's using Firefox? Who's using Internet Explorer? Awesome. Safari? Okay. I did a, we, we tend to do a lot of stuff on Chrome, so, and I've tested it on other browsers as well. I've tested it on my wife's iPad. I can run it on my phone, my iPhone. You know, so we've been testing in various places, but I'm very curious. This is going to be a great 
test for WMT to see how well what happens when all 40 of us hit that. All right, so the URL, this will be, again, systems.colorado.edu slash WMT. All right, and so I've, hopefully I have it up on Irina's computer. All right, so what I'd like to do now is I want to go through the buttons and do a little bit of buttonology and talk about kind of what things do and why they are there in WMT. All right, you can see that there are three panels. There's a header panel that runs along the top, and you can see the only thing it really does is you know, process a log in. There's also the model panel on the side, on the left side, and the parameters panel on the right side. All right, so let's... All right, so let's walk through, uh, and I want to show you some things that you can do with WMT. So right now, you can see uh, I am not logged in as a user in WMT. If I try to do anything, it's not going to work. So I can click buttons. You can see they don't do anything. I can click the driver. I can choose avulsion, but it doesn't do anything. So you have to be logged in in order to do anything in WMT. So that's our first step. Let's do a login. All right, so I invite you guys to create uh, new accounts on WMT. You can provide an email address and a password of your choice. And if you don't want to use your real email, I, I, underneath the hood, I, I, I do some checking to make sure it's a, a valid email, but I don't like email you or anything, so it could be a, a bogus email. Yes, that's a good point. So it's different from the login on the system's website. It's also different from the login, for example, on Beach. Now, we thought about this a little bit. We, we wanted to keep it separate from Beach because you know, with Beach, you need to have an identity, for example. We, th we, we thought about using the same login as we had for the systems website, but that login system is set up through MediaWiki, and it was just kind of a pain for right now. So that is something we're going to look into to see if we can implement it later on, because it would be really nice to have the same login and have it automatically recognized. OK, so when you log in, if this is your first time logging in, you'll be presented with a dialog that asks you to repeat your password. Yeah? I'm going to take a, take a look. OK, click OK, please. Uh, like, you know, how about uh, try uh, try refreshing the window? So just do a refresh, All right? And then be this page, right? Okay, click OK. Okay. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Sure, I'm going to look over at Eric. Hey, Eric, yeah. you you have a moment to help with this, possibly? Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. All right, and this is cool. I mean, people let me know if things aren't working. It's good. And if anything goes wrong, you can blame me. Right, so you don't have to have an account. You can just use any email address and password combination. Any, yes, any email and password will work. Go ahead. So what? Right. Right. So there, are, there will be two separate logins. There's a login for WMT, and a separate login for Beach. Okay. So we'll come to that. All right. So I'm going to log in. Uh, after you've logged in the first time, you'll see that. 
WMP remembers your email. It doesn't remember your password. Okay. Does that work out okay for people? Any other questions or comments on that? Okay, so now that we're logged in, we can do things. All right, I'm gonna take a few minutes to, to just go through the different buttons that we see and show examples of how they work. All right, I'm starting on the model panel. All right, you can see there's an open, a save, and a run button. If you hover over the buttons, you can see the tooltip appears. All right, in general, I tried to put tooltips on every, every possible widget that I could find in WMT. So this is maybe a first place to look for help. Uh, there's also a more button. So this is where we grouped other actions that maybe, not, that maybe won't occur as often. So I could do save model as, I could duplicate a model if I had an existing model that was to be saved. I can delete models that I've created. I can manage labels. Uh, hang on to this. I'm gonna come back and talk about labels a little bit later. This is kind of a bigger topic, but just to prepare you, Think Gmail. All right, I can get information on the components that are currently uh, available inside of WMT. I can view the run status of a simulation. We'll come back and see this later. And at the bottom, uh, help and about WMT. I'm actually going to click on this because uh, I have links to two documents, which I would like to show early on here. So one of the documents is help. So I've made a, a help document for WMT, and it's kind of loosely what I'm following here in this clinic. So if you click this, you'll get the WMT help at the systems web page, or the systems website. There's also a tutorial, and I'll be following this a little bit later in my talk as well. So there's a help and a tutorial. All right, so those, uh, four, those are the four action buttons in the model panel. Let's start, uh, let's create a model. Okay, so to do this, I need to have a driver for the model. Let's see what's available. If I click on this big fat driver button, you, don't, you, do, not, you do not have to click just on the plus, you can click anywhere on the button. You can see you get a list of components that are available on WMT. All right. Um, I'm gonna choose CEM, the coastline evolution model. Okay, now when I selected that, you see that CEM has been loaded into the driver slot of my model. You can see that CEM uh, exposes its two uses ports, river and waves. You can also see that the parameters for CEM have been listed. All right, let's, I'm gonna leave aside the parameters for a moment. Let, let's take a look at the, the model panel. Let's take a look at that driver component, CEM. You can see that the, uh, the icon changed on the button. I should make a side note that Eric and I had a lot of fun with the buttons and, and icons, so. The, we tried to map meaningful icons to the buttons. If I click CEM, which is now a component that fills the driver slot, you can see that a new menu exists. So in the new menu, I can show the parameters of this component, which actually is already being done. I can get information on this component. All right, and again, this is, you know, as James mentioned in his, in his, uh, talks, his, his talk this morning, you know, this is the way to bridge the black box. All right, so I can immediately get information on this component. The name, the version, the DOI, a summary, a link the model help page. I used these links when I was developing the tutorial. It was pretty fun. So I can go to the help page for CEM. As well as the developer of the model. All right, so I can show the parameters and get information. I can also delete. So if I wanted to, I could delete that component. I'm gonna bring it back, actually, because I wanna use it. All right, so. Uh, this is the uh, component menu. All right, let's go a little further. Let's 
let's fill these users ports. Let's find some components that will provide river. So we have one component available that, can, that provides river. It's evulsion. All right, again, if I click on evulsion, you can see I could show its parameters, for example. All right, so now I'm showing evulsion's parameters. Now, it's a little bit off the screen, but that's OK, because you can pan over in this panel. Oops, no. I'm using Irina's laptop, so the, 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 key, the key mappings are a little bit different than mine. There we go. All right, so you can see you can pan around in that panel. You can also drag the divider as well. So if I wanted to get something bigger, I can go like that. The numbers in the box, yes, they are default values. They are default values chosen. Um, now, I want to be careful with this. I think they're chosen by the model developers. Is that correct, Arena? Thank you for explaining that, Irina. Yeah. That is a very good question. And that's actually my next thing. So yeah. So for example, you can see here. So I just had, you know, I, I added a vulsion. To, uh, as, uh, to fill the, the user's port uh, for CEM. And Evulsion has an elevation port that CEM fills. So this will be an example of model coupling. There's going to be feedback here. Does that answer your question? Questions? Okay, let me go a little bit further on this because for CEM, note, note the, the, the second little CEM box, I put a little icon there. I tried, I'm trying to show that this is in fact the same instance of this component in each case. So the second, the second box for CEM is actually an alias to the instance of the, of the driver. So for example, let's say that I so I have evulsion. I'm, I'm showing evulsion. Let's show CEM. And if I change the parameter, for example, just I want to, 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 to demonstrate that these are the same instance. So let's say it's a 150 instead of 50. All right. So now if I now show evulsion, if I show CEM now, you can see that that change has been mapped as well. So. What we're trying to show is that these are the same instance of the component. Okay, questions? Yep, go ahead. That's a good question. Let me demonstrate what happens right now. So the direct answer to your question is, yeah, you could. But uh, probably the last thing that I need to do, this is so, W he is at 0.99 right now, in my opinion. So I need to make some movies because James would like them. And I also need to make it so that you could put a separate instance. So that you could, for example, have two instances of CEM in the same model. As it stands right now, you just get an alias again. 
So that's like the last thing I need to do for WMT. Go ahead. How about this? What I see, this is uh, an example that James has used before, I think. And let me see if I get this right. Um, I think it was using child. And now you can see, for example, there are two base levels. You know, so for example, Right, right, yeah. So I could, I, I perhaps would like separate instances of base, of base level, for example, here. Okay, all right, okay. All right. Right, yeah. So again, this is the, so again, this is the, you know, both, both of these, boxes for child refer to the same component instance. It's logic. They'll be the same. I mean, these are the exact same instances. Yep, go ahead. Oh, good, good. Here, I can help with that. Uh, hover your cursor over it, and you'll see that it fills the subaerial delta port. Right. I, yeah, we could put that there, but it is, it's, it's just, yeah. It is given as a tool tip. And I think this is also I'm trying to think of a way to say this. You know, I I automatically populated that uses port with the same instance of child. This is something that I did on purpose because I have not yet fixed I've not yet completed that one last task of allowing separate components. So I do this for you as a convenience. All right, so and this is something Eric and I talked about a little bit, you know, so I understand what you're saying. Maybe it would be nice if I didn't do that, you know, so that you could, you could fill it in yourself and you could see that that's the subaerial delta uses port. So I went maybe once, I, I went a little fur, further trying to be convenient, trying to be helpful. Okay, other questions? Okay. Let's go a little further. Let's, let's take a look now at the parameters. All right, so again, this is more buttonology. So you can see underneath in the parameters panel, we have three action buttons. The first one resets all component parameters to their default values. So if I started changing parameters willy-nilly, I could then click this button with the lightning bolt appropriately and zap all of those parameters back to their default values. Next is the uh, view input files button. So the idea is that you could click this and take a look at what the input files for this model component would look like if you were running uh, or basically trying to execute the model from a shell prompt. 
So for example, let's take a look at the, uh, the, the default. So you can, you can use it for, uh, if you save a model, you can actually see what the input files would look like for that saved model. Now, because I've not yet saved the model that I've created here, I can look at the defaults. I can choose but different formats to look at, let's say HTML. All right, so you can see the different input files, what they would look like. All right, and then the last button is, again, information on the component. So again, bridging that black box, making it easier to find information. Okay. Questions or comments so far? Okay, just a few more things then, and then I'd like to let you guys try to experiment a bit. All right, so uh, let's take a look at the parameters. So how about this? Let's take a look at the first one here, simulation runtime. You can see that I put my cursor over the box where the value is, and you can see that it gives a valid range. So it shows what range of values that that parameter can take. You know, and as Irene has explained, you know, the default values are a, a useful, simple default. So I can put in other numbers. You know, so my runtime in days is 100 years. Let's say I only want to do, say I only want to do one year. All right, so I've, I've modified the text in that box. If I hit the enter key or the tab key, the, that this text will be parsed. All right, so you can see it got parsed and it got the point zero put after it. All right, so the, the boxes are somewhat, somewhat intelligent. Note, I could also use scientific notation. So instead of 365, say I want to do 3.65 E2. Now if I hit tab, it'll go to the next box, or if I hit enter, it'll stay in this box, but process the, re process the information. All right, so it converted that scientific notation to standard notation. Note that you have to use a capital E, not a small E. This is disturbing, so I always use small E's. But if I use a small E, I get a message, an, an error. So note that if you use, if, if, you, if you put text that does not belong there, so that's okay. But if I did this, for example, and hit enter, I would get a, a, a box colored in, in a, a, a red color. This is my warning color. Now note that there's nothing wrong with doing this. I, I, I won't stop you from saving a model or running a model with something like this with one of these warning boxes, but your results may not be good. Okay, uh, just before I leave this one quick example, so if I hover again, I guess I need something in the box in order to hover. All right, I just wanted to put a quick example of showing something out of range. So I put 66 just because I hit a couple keys if I did negative 66, that would be out of the range of acceptable simulation runtimes. And again, I get the red box. Okay. So, two things that I want to show, and then we'll try some of this ourselves. So, I want to save this model, even though I know this is incomplete. I want to demonstrate the act of saving. I also want to go back and talk about labels. Recall I mentioned that earlier, but I put it aside. So let me tackle labels first because they have uh, an impact on how we would save and open models. All right, so those of you who have used CMT, who has used CMT, by the way? I should have asked that a long time ago. Wow, okay, oh, awesome, okay, so this is new stuff then. So CMT had the notion of a project. You know, it's, it's a way to group a set of simulations that you created. You know, like, for example, Irina has created a set of simulations that she will show after this. And you know, they ordinarily, or in, in, in CMT, they would have been grouped into a, a, a project. Here, in WMT, we are trying a different tactic, taking a, 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 a hint from Gmail. And in order to organize and categorize models that you create, I've implemented a labeling system. So when you save a model, you can attach labels to it. Some labels are predefined, which will help you. Label, you can also make your own labels. And the idea is that when you save a model and attach labels to it, 
at a later point when you come back and open models, you can then select labels to filter the results. So you can filter what you can see. All right, so let's look at the labeling system. So this again, underneath the more menu, I can manage my labels. Okay, so you can see that there are labels that have been predefined for the different components that exist in WMT. Note also that they are public. All right, so these are available to everyone. Also, child, the driver of this model that I'm about to save, has been selected as a label for this model. So this is automatic. WNT will automatically select the driver of your model as a label. So you can go back later on, oh, what was the model that I made with CMT? Or with, uh, with CEM, for example. I could filter on CEM. Oops. There's also a tag or a label. I use those interchangeably. There's also a label that uses your login email. And then there are other labels that we can create. So how about this? For, for this example, I like to add a new label to it. So I'm going to add a new label. How would I call this systems meeting? So now I can know, actually, how about I go, I can add two labels. I can add systems meeting, and maybe I'll add 2014. So I've added two labels. Now I can now I can go check those. So there's oops, 2014, and there's systems meeting. And so now when I save this, you know, these labels will be attached. And so at a later point, I can come back and I think about, well, what was that model that I made at the systems meeting in 2014? I can filter my search results to find this one. OK. So I've added some labels to this model. Now let me save it. So I can go to the Save button. I get a, a dialog box that will prompt me. I should probably call it something better. I should probably call it something like, There's a labels button where you can interrogate the labels that you set. So I can see what labels have been set on this model. And I can save it. All right, this isn't saved locally, this machine. This is saved at, uh, on the server, so basically on river. No, actually, so the labels that you create uh, are private, so they belong to you. So th those labels that I just created were private. They were private just to me right now. Now, if you guys created the same label, that's okay. It is a public, right? For so, for example, child is a public label. You know, this is available to everyone. Whereas like 2014 and systems meeting, you can see that they don't have that public text next to them. So they're private just for me. OK, let's prove that this works. If I delete this model, I should be able to open the model. Oops, not save. I want to open. All right. And I want to filter on the labels that are available. So let's say I look at systems meeting. Aha, there's my model. All right, so this is an example of using the labeling system. All right, questions or comments? OK, well, um, so. I'm a little torn, so I have a, th this was basically kind of the buttonology. I wanted to go through uh, an example as well. So I, I have the tutorial example, and I, I'm a little torn. I was thinking, you know, do I want to go through it? You know, we could all go through it together, or do you guys want to try it yourselves? You guys have any opinions on that? Go for it. The data. Oh, the good, good, good. All right. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the data are going to reside on the execution server. All right. So this is stuff that uh, I don't know if I have the right words to explain it. Irina, can I ask for help with that? Hydrogen, got it. Yep, will do. Yeah, so there. So those are the ones that are available, and you also upload your own. Oops, I have to save it. Okay. Data files? No, no, those are those are your user files. Yeah, they resign your user space. What's that? Oh, we have a system set up for that, Eric. Okay. Irina and I have talked about that. It has not yet been implemented. So we, we only have private for the user and public for everyone. We don't have like a protected right now. Yeah, yeah. Or it should be my job to make it right and do the right thing. I should do the right thing and make protected as well. So that, that's one thing we have to do.
because we're still, you still have to provide your own login credentials to Beach. So the model's there, but the data's not there. This is, this is our evolution of the idea of a project that, was existing, that existed in CMT. And again, the idea I take from Gmail, it was pretty well there, so I want to make the same idea here. All right, other questions? Okay, I talk a lot, I know, darn. Okay, so Irene, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I can do a summary and we take a slight break before we start yours. Okay. So how about this? Just can we make a run? Yeah, okay. Do that. So how about this? Um, let, let me just start over. All right. Uh, the refreshing is really nice. So if you guys would like to try this with me, it would be totally cool. We can try to hit WMT I hit our server, all 40 of us at the same time, and see what happens. I do Hydratron, yeah. The, the, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the example that's in the tutorial. All right, so this is, again, re recall I showed the, the tutorial earlier. All right, so we're going to do a Hydratron example. And I'm choosing Hydratron because we've tested this. We're pretty sure it works. All right, so I'm going to load Hydratron as my driver. Uh, how about I change one parameter? Uh, Hydrotrend likes to work in years. So for the simulation runtime, instead of 100 days, I'll make it 365 days. All right, I, I hit tab, so it verified by 365. Okay, let's save this. I'm going to save this as my name. So you can see the labels I'm selected, Hydrotrend, and my login. Maybe I should do a, I should do, yeah, let me do the, I love my, my labels. So I'll make sure I got my labels checked as well. There. Oops. All right, so I'll save this. All right, let's run it. All right, so the run button, click that. Uh, the idea is that eventually we would have other hosts as well, but for right now, Beach is our host. So this is where you need to log in with your uh, credentials for Beach. So my username is different, for example. Moment of truth, I'll hit run. All right. Okay, so I get back a dialog. It says that I've submitted my run. I can choose to view the status of this run now. All right, so I can see, I can see some other people have done this as well. I put my, I put my initials after mine so I can see it. All right, so the, the model ran. You can see it's complete, available for pickup. I can download it. All right, so it's, this, uh, it's a TARGZ file. Let me know if I need to pause at any, at any point along here or, 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 or feel free to break with a question. Oh. This isn't my computer. <laughs> Sorry. I can do, uh, do you have iTerm? No, okay. Or terminal. All right. Does it go to uh, downloads? All right. There we go. So there's my targz file that I've downloaded. I 
mean I'm changing your defaults, just so you know. All right. <laughs> OK, so I could uh, unzip this. All right, so you can see the uh, information inside. There's a README, the HydroTrend output. All right, so the input files, the output files. There's a time vector for us. If I go to the output, all right, so what are all these files? You can get information on this from the model help page from WMT. You can go to the system's website to find out about this, which is what I did when I made the tutorial. So for example, I know that uh, like hydroascii.q is the discharge at the river mouth. All right, so there's the output from the model. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through and do a plot that took a little bit more time. But if you took a look at the tutorial, you can see that at the end, when I download, I made a quick example of reading the data from uh, a few of these files and making a simple plot in Python. Oh, lots of questions. Go No, not to rerun the same thing. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it wouldn't know about that. One thing you can do, you notice that there that uh, there are helpful icons. You know, so I click the uh, I click the download button. You can also click the trash icon. So if you want your simulation results to go away, you can delete them. Does that answer your question? Keep going. throw it away without letting you know. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, totally cool. Uh, we should do that. <laughs> we just haven't done that. So that was actually part of the feature of, of CMT in that it had a, a visit, a, a, a software visualization suite uh, along with it. And so, yeah, this, this, th that, is, that is an option. It is not implemented, but it is an option. Of course.
Serena. thing? Did you have that? <laughs> you? Okay. All right. Anything else? Other questions? The questions have been great. Thank you. Go ahead. Yep. The, uh, uh, I, w I went to the you know the view run status page. We can get to that as well from this menu item as well. Yeah, that's that. Yep, that's this. Uh, that's the same page. Let me close it just to demonstrate. Refresh your browser, maybe, because when everyone's submitting jobs, this continue this queues, this page queues.
brief summary, then we'll take a tiny break, just let Irina set up, and we'll come back and see some labs. All right, so with WMT, you can see that we have uh, allowed users to select a component model from a list. You can build coupled models. Uh, you can view and edit the parameters of the model components. You can save the models that you design to a server where they, be, they can be accessed anywhere. You know, you could set up, you, you, could, you could design a model at your office. You could go home, tweak it, and run it, for example. You can share saved models within the, within the broad community using that public label. And you can run a model by connecting to a remote uh, HPCC where the system software stack is installed. All right, questions or comments? All right, let's take a very brief break and I can switch on with Irina. You want to use this at all, Irina? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, it'd be all right. I think. Yeah, no, of course. Um, can you guys hear me? Is this on? Yeah? Okay. Um, what I wanted to like pitch for in this like sort of like next 45 minutes is that we think this is ready to be used by faculty or by TAs who like teach with. And I've been teaching with CMT the last three years or so and there would be like there would be plenty of like little things that would frustrate people, and I'm sure there will be like little things that would frustrate people with this too again, but I think this is much more robust and we've tried to make it um, a bit more accessible than the previous tool was. And so uh, we're moving to this um, uh, integrated system between the CNTMS Wiki and the WMT and like provide a number of labs for people to like use, and I'm hoping if people buy into this, we can like, make that sort of repository of labs bigger and bigger over time and uh, uh, sort of like, target it towards just specific topics a bit more. And so the ones that I'll like, share with you today are just like, like basically there are examples and there are worked out examples. And they set maybe the sort of the scene of how this is going to go. Uh, but hopefully, much more people are interested in this, uh, using this in their classes, and uh, we can like expand it to different models and different components. So I'm gonna spend like maybe five or five minutes or so to motivate why would we even want to teach modeling in uh, the earth sciences. Um, I realize I'm preaching to the crowd or like sort of my own people who are all modelers and like we think this is an important thing, but it's actually um, pretty um, embedded in sort of like how people um, view earth sciences, how they view predictions, and like it's of a much lower level uh, ingrained in our educational system, and we can like sort of use that opportunity um, and use these tools to make it more accessible for um, maybe undergraduates or like even at some point uh, um, in the K-12 system. Um, I'm going to show you like the possibilities that the WMT offers for that and sort of how we set up uh, to do that. So 
even from the beginning, like see, not all of you are aware of like how long the history of the CSD mess initiative has been, but it, even from the beginning that, uh, of CSD mess, there was always this idea of like, oh, you know, like once we've got like this toolbox of little components together, and like maybe the bigger components have like uniform graphical user interfaces, it'd be easier for people to use. It will be easier for people to teach with. And so there's very much always an education mission uh, to developing. And so we're trying to hold up that promise and um, make things easier to use and like make them as robust as possible. And when you dig down in sort of what the National Science Foundation brought out in um, documents about what they think is so important to uh, um, our graduates, undergraduates, and even into the K-12 curriculum, then like there's very basic skills that they want um, people to have. There's very basic concepts that they want people to grasp that have to do with like modeling and like what models are to our society and what they are to policy making right now. And it's things like asking questions and defining problems. Can you then like work that into a theoretical model in your head? Can you then work your theoretical model into like something that's a computer model or a equation? Um, can you then like say like, okay, I'm gonna do 10 runs, but I'm varying these parameters, and why would you even do that? So those are, are questions that you can like actually tackle at a fairly low level. And it's, it's also something that's like, if, it only, if you only need a computer, it's even accessible to like almost every lab. You know, you don't have to go like to a far like, skill location or like, in a certain sense, it, uh, modeling isn't accessible uh, tool, but we need to make the tool easy to use and make it accessible to do that. And then, of course, in all our research, uh, we now have the use model models. Do you want to? All right. <laughs> Your microphone this? got turned off. Okay. Can I see that right here? But you guys did it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear any echoing, so like. How's that? Better. I can hear it now too. And and I think that in society, like modeling is becoming imperative to like forecasting and making predictions. And like I put up the example of Hurricane Sandy, it's like one of the examples of like, okay, we have a model, the models run, and like this is a prediction that people are using. And of course, weather modeling. Um, there's like countless of examples where surface process modeling is important and like people are trying to um, to make predictions based on surface process modeling. But if we want like our students to like, maybe even if they don't become modelers, we want them to be aware of like the role models play and what's behind them. So with that in mind, I have like sort of these objectives and this comes from like countless EKT working group meetings too. It's not just me making this up. But um, at CSD Mess, I am the EKT person, so that's why I'm like presenting. Um, so what are le learning outcomes of these labs and what is it sort of that I envision is important to these labs? Well, there's sort of like two overarching philosophical objectives that I have. I want people to be aware of what's a model versus what is data. There, that's a very vague boundary already. But people need to be aware that if they look at a forecast of a Hurricane Sandy that I was just showing, that that's a model forecast. Whereas if they look at like sort of like um, afterwards what has been measured at tidal gauges, then like they, they're looking at data. But you needed the model to like forecast for New York what, when the, uh, surge was going to arrive, or like how high the surge that was going to arrive um, was going to be. And that is where the models have their role, and I want people to be aware of like th this is the role that models have in our society right now. Um, I also want students or learners uh, to be aware that like any model that you make, is it going to be a simplification? 
any model that you make has assumptions, any model comes with uncertainty. And so those are like, secretly, I try to like address these philosophical issues in the model labs. And it's not that every lab has like a whole philosophical discussion, but I try to make people aware of that this is part of what you're looking at is a model and there's assumptions that are made. Um, other things are skills. Like we want that um, people are able to visualize data um, or ask questions, um, interrogate the model results that they get. Um, we want people to be familiar with the fact that you could submit a job to an HPCC system. This is maybe a graduate uh, student type of skill. But like one of the things when I was teaching class with the CMT, I would like ask questions afterwards and then like, try to evaluate what people had experienced from this. And one of the things is that I think they came away with like, oh, is that the big deal? You know, we just submit a job to a supercomputer and it runs our model. And yes, there's like a whole added level of complexity if you want to like submit it parallel, et cetera, et cetera. But if you just want to submit jobs to a supercomputer, that's not such a big deal anymore. We can do that through an interface like this. Um, and so this is one of the things that CSD is after, that like people are um, comfortable working on these machines, comfortable like with queuing jobs up and um, using that. There's also topical and conceptual understanding that we want to take, people take away. And these are like from the list of um, sort of the big um, ticket issues that I got from the EKT working group, like to identify feedbacks, which CSDMS coupled models are perfect for that. You're like searching for the feedbacks between the different components. And that's where the new science often lies. Um, we want to like make people aware that like not all processes are linear. There's complexity in processes. There's randomness in processes. So all those kind of concepts are like hidden in the labs, uh, possibly. So we've been using CMT before uh, for this, and we're moving to the WMT um, right now. Um, we've been teaching this clinic, so like every year there will still be this clinic, and like once you've taken it, like you probably don't want to repeat it every year. But uh, um, hopefully, we want, if our community keeps expanding, then more and more people are aware of what can be done with this tool. Um, I use it every year in the um, um, NSET. Summer Institute for two days, and like people really get to run models for two days. And so it's a bit more scientific than what we're doing here with the botanology, as Mark was saying today. Um, so there's about 100 grad students that have like gone through this um, little training of two days and like playing around ones over there. Um, oh, yeah, and I'm very proud to say that they still come back to the CSD mass meeting after they've taken those two days. And so um, to make this an effective teaching tool, you need to mo the models to be like exposed to the public. And that's one of the core tasks that CSDMS has. And when we really first started probing people for models, we like designed this metadata concept where like people, developers themselves, submitted this metadata to us about what language the model is in, like what time steps it runs with, like what's literature references, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so there's a sort of a core little database of each model that's in the metadata. And then in addition to that, the WMT is integrated with these model help pages that have a bit more on the theory of the models. So um, I think I put up some examples. So you can go to like a model help page and actually find like the equations that go with the processes that you're modeling. And there's a nomenclature that tells you like, okay, if I'm filling in um, later today, we're looking at Brad and Andrew's example um, of like wave um, highness factor. And like then you can like look up and sort of see what the little explanation is. In this case, I was good enough that I talked to Andrew once I like put it up and like he made a couple corrections and like clarified it a bit. But so I did, this is a wiki. Um, I know you guys are like overbooked, everyone is, but it's information on your model and your conceptualizations that's on this wiki at some point. 
And that's what's going to be used by the community if people propagate and use this model. So we, we will try to probe you once we got like um, information on models up to like make sure that it's correct and that you like it. And sometimes there's things that we still misinterpret because these are not our models necessarily. Um, And so on the educational repository, so under the CSDMS webpage, there's a um, section with labs. And um, they used to be CMT labs. So like not all of them have been tr transferred, but there's a couple that um, we transferred for the, to like make this ready for this meeting. And so there's like, I think there's Hydrotrend and Plume and Setflux and uh, CEM. Those are like the ones that have been transferred to this system. And then there's others that are going to follow pretty soon. So the level these labs are written for is like for advanced undergraduates in earth sciences or oceanography or like sort of the core fields that CSDMS is all about, earth surface processes in its widest sense. Um, each lab, in my experience, each lab takes like three to four hours maybe. And then possibly you can ask people to like do a report or like plot a little extra output or something and like make it into some homework, but that's about it. Um, if you have very fast students, they'll like complete it in two hours. And if you have like people who aren't as familiar with like grabbing things or like maybe manipulating data or um, visualizing, then it will take them a little longer. Um, each of the labs will have the link to that tutorial. So like you basically can go in, like if nobody has ever used WMT, like maybe first do that little tutorial. That will take maybe 20 minutes or so, I, I think. So, so like arbitrary, which one you like will start with, you can still do that tutorial right away. Um, there will be like a PowerPoint that has a bit on the um, processes and the relevance of that specific model or the specific coupling that you're looking at. Um, so what I usually do is I use that PowerPoint to set people up the first 20 minutes and say like this is what we're talking about. We're like talking about coastal stratigraphy, blah, 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 blah. And then like you have like a little bit of uh, background on the model already. Um, it's harvested from the model help pages and like Sometimes it's from talks that people gave here. Um, then I have instructions for runs. And um, all the runs that like are proposed there to do um, have been tested. So once you go like wi wide out of that domain, or not even that wide out of domain, I don't know for sure. Like Hopefully, the model is robust. Not, we don't know what all developers did with their models necessarily. So like. Once you get like really creative, you could like still crash models. But the runs that are proposed in the labs are um, they're tested and like pretty fast in most cases. There's a bunch of questions to like meet topical learning objectives, and there's like key references. So as you saw from Mark's demonstration, you do need a supercomputer account. Um, a lot of you have been set up with these. And so it's sort of like digging around in your email or like reminding yourself what your password was. Um, but yes, you do need that. Um, it's a big deal to run um, or to have like access to this resource. And it takes us a little while to like process that. So once you're like, you know you're going to teach a class, or you know you have like a couple grad students and you want them to use this tool, like just have them email us or like use the instructions on our site to like set up an account on Beach. Um, it takes three working days was what I put in, and then like um, somebody out of our team said like no, make that like five working days to be like entirely sure that you make it before your labs start. Or what I uh, like to do is. If I have like a full semester, I like just do this all like sort of logistics in the first class and then take it onwards from there. So they need to do this quick tutorial and then yes, they do need to like 
get familiar with NetCDF as a format or use the ASCII. Um, if models provide ASCII files, they can like still stick to the ASCII for some of the simpler models that's possible. But the standard in our framework is going to be NetCDF. Um, you can like use MATLAB, you can use Python, like your own favorite tool to like deal with NetCDF files. We recommend Visit for visualization. MATLAB's better for calculations, so like it's kind of up to, to you. So as I said, there's be there'll be like um, sort of instructions on like how to set up a parameter or sort of like a couple of screenshots to like sort of guide you around like where to go and then questions like I mean I put this one up because yes you like have this model and it has a removal rate and you can like sort of intuitively guess that like a removal rate probably has something to do with how fast things settle well as soon as you ask the question is like is this removal rate the same as Stokes veloc settling velocity you need to invoke like a whole like theory and like go back to like either Wikipedia or like a textbook and sort of figure out like oh yeah what was settling velocity again like let's ca calculate Stokes velocity settling velocity so like it's sort of like the questions expand quite a bit on like what if a person just wants to change parameters then like they're not be going to be able to answer these questions yet there's like theory there that uh, um, that can like motivate people to like dig a little deeper into what is behind these models. Um, I'd like, like how many people have their Beach account and like know their password? Okay, cool. Um, so keep your hands up for a second. If there's one on each table, then maybe people can gather around and like sort of like do these run or like do a couple runs and like sort of like do try to run this and like other people can sort of like gather around those laptops that there are maybe teams of two or three I think is going to work out. Um, so suppose that we go to this um, lab that's the CEM lab and just toy around. I think we have 15 minutes or so um, and then I expect that you guys will have like a bunch of questions after playing. Um, and then hopefully that will like help people to understand like how this works and what's up with it. Are there questions right now? We uh, when um, when we wrote the renewal for CSDMS, we proposed to do it in a sort of a tiered approach, where um, the simplest is like animations from models that still teach some, but some or like still are a visualization of like something that's um, a relevant process and you can document those and CSDMS actually has an archive of like animations and movies um, then sort of you can step up and say hey I have a model that's fairly complex but like let's bring it down to just the parameters that have like um, a lot of impact. Like if I use Hydrotrend as an example, it's like this, all these bells and whistles to do um, river sediment low to the ocean. Well, what if you have just three whistles or three buttons and you say like, um, I can change those um, and it's just I add a dam or I increase the temperature and I still look at the effects of that. And so we called those like sort of slider models or like sort of very easy models and that's like our second tier. Um, it's very easy to build those in WMT but we haven't built them. Um, but it's basically you, um, instead of presenting every, a, a student with all the options of a full model, you present them with just a few buttons but the sort of the flavor of it would be the same. And then these are like for advanced undergrads and like graduate students and like they're, that they're pretty serious, I think. Um, so, so that's the vision, a tiered approach. Um, we welcome ideas and like um, the EKT group is sort of the group that tries to set the scene for that. Other questions? 
Sorry? Oh, yep. Setflix 3D. Look something on the web browser site. This is not that the run is not running. Um, I think there's this is like a web. Yeah, it's probably. Did you guys find the lab that I was trying to point to? It's under education, and then labs. I think uh, let's look under like saved runs and then see whether there's a child to set flex there. I know for sure child runs, like these are like, yeah, exactly. yeah. and um, I'm pretty sure, I, mean, I know the like combination runs too, but I'm not sure like it runs through here. One time I uh, ran the hydro change, it also gave me the same. Yeah, yeah it looks as if it's like something on the browser side. So the, the message comes back is from the API. Okay. It's something, it's, something, it's our fault. So, but I, I don't know what it is, so we'll try to figure it out. And also I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, been submitted for a while. Uh, 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 yeah, I don't know what the those are. Like hydrogen, like pretty much should run I mean, I've tested that pretty extensively. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I would do is uh, just rerun what you were trying to run. Okay. Um, I'll give it all my and uh, so, so I know, like, if it's something simple as uh, uh, your user word, your user login wasn't right, it will give you a different message here. Yes, you will say like um, the yeah. authorization. Yeah, so this is the native output of, of child, um, which is what how Greg wrote it up originally. Yeah, well, that means, um, I mean, because there is the option. Uh, right, so here you can, yeah, like, CDF say the NetCDF files or the VTK files. Um, yeah. It only gives um, native. No, 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 you have to switch them on then. Oh, okay. So, like, uh, erosion rate or surface elevation. Or but then it and then it will make a net CDF file. Yeah, for each you have an insect. Uh, get it? Yep. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Did so now if you have. Oh, I tried it. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then like look at what your interval is, like because make it. If it's a long run, you want it to be n not. Yeah. Is it working for you guys? Yeah. Oh, are you trying hydrogen? I think well, I got a crash. Okay, yeah. No. This this one, uh, there's no communication with Setflux in this one. No, but or in these other So like where it says, you know, that you can Yeah, okay. When you do the, bed the river bed load is okay. in the yeah, and so like you can switch it to 200 there. Got it. Yeah, you asked a really difficult question about the combination with Setflux 2D between oh, yeah. child and 2D. Because then you, right, it can be done. Yeah. And uh, because they can pass information between each other. Right, and that was one of the options that dropped out. Right. And uh, so it can be done. Yeah. Um, but like it's more logical to put 3D and 2D right, together. Right. 
but it can be done. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I also I generated a crash um, trying to run a child with so Netflix 3D. 3D. Yeah. 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 I, that combination is like pretty finicky uh -huh. because basically what you have to start saying is like when do you call something a river? Because at the boundary, at the coastal boundary, right. child will have fluxes at every cell. Uh -huh. But if you have to run set flux for every cell, it becomes like totally yeah. unmanageable. So like we use cutoffs to say like, okay, I only want the 10 biggest or uh -huh. the five biggest or so. And so there's a bit of like administration that isn't, I think, quite done okay. very robustly in this All system. Right. Okay. Um, but it's very close, and I mean they they've run together, yeah. but not through this. Right. Yeah. 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 And so if you like, uh, um, um, refresh your browser, you like see the clock ticking. I hope. This is the one that I. Is that the one that you submitted? Okay. Which one are you running child? Or is the uh, CEM? CEM. Okay. Yeah, I was just going through this example. Okay. Did you look, hook it up to Hydrotrend? No, to River. Okay, good. Yeah, that should be working. It takes about three to four minutes, I oh, think. Okay. Yeah. But uh, in mine, it shows like how many days it is. So I'm not 100% oh. sure that. Hmm. Maybe I did. When I did the test one earlier too, it, it I got the same. Okay, let's um, bring this other one. So there's a lab that I know 100% sure is going to run. So let's test that one. Um, so it's one of these public ones. Mm -hmm. um, it's called CEM Waves Evolution and River. That one. So now it will populate everything with those default values. Uh, let's say, like, I make it a little shorter just to see it after a couple minutes. The 12,000, I think it took seven minutes mm -hmm. last time I ran it. Um, so save. Let's save as something. Okay. And then run. And then if you don't see a time thing there, then um, okay. Oh, yeah, th that's a password error. Yeah. yeah. I think this, I mean, that one, and then you can like play it from there. I'm trying to set up this one actually. Okay. To follow this one. Yeah. No, you can Six just like, just hundred times step. Eh? Yep. Does it take long? Yeah. It, it, take, it takes three, like yeah. maybe four or five minutes. So this one? This yep. One, okay. What's the other parameter? Then, is it called a high level bed load input 200 kilograms per second? Yep. Are you guys familiar with uh, visualizing that CDF files? So there's this package visit. I'll put up a, um, I mean, I might have like a link in the lab even. And uh, it's a fairly quick download. And like any NetCDF file, you can like visualize in that pretty fast. It's also not a huge deal in MATLAB. There's like a library for NetCDF files. Um, and so both of those are like good options. So visit this open source and like <laughs> bedlo is under the river. Huh? Uh, under river, if you like have the WMT open um, and you click on the you know, um, like here, show the parameters, ah. then there is the bedlo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will like make a bigger delta. Oh, like, um, is the output on? In like, click on the CEM, um, sh show parameters. 
and then if you scroll down, there's, it should. So output for seawater to sediment depth ratio is a good one. Mm -hmm. And so, and you want it every hundred time steps, I think. Hundred means what? Day? Or it's a uh, well, yeah. It's hun I mean, CEM is not quite. It's like six thousand time steps, and like you do is once. Day also this one. Yeah. G? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that CEM draws from a distribution. Mm -hmm. So one event maybe like um, represent 20 days or 100 days or like depending on what magnitude event you grab. So like it, it draws waves from a distribution. Mm -hmm. So times it, it goes 6,000 times through this like drawing of an event, but it doesn't necessarily have to be days. Okay. Okay, good. And this one said running model. Oh, so so uh, um, if your netcdf file, like if you like don't change it to like a sort of a reasonable number of slices, mm -hmm. like if you want six thousand slices, it will take a while to run. If it like because I was trying to to ask people like do it every two hundred fifty time steps or every hundred time steps, but I, I think the yeah that's yeah. good yeah hundred should be good. Okay, maybe it's still. Just the other one. That that one yeah. No, um, but we want it very badly and. Uh, um, Basically, for uncertainty and sensitivity analysis. Yeah. So, and so one of the ideas is this was what James brought up this morning was like to like wrap the coda, which does that stuff, into this framework so that you could set up like it more easily to say like okay, I always want to vary, you know, like um, the wave height from one to seven, and then like right. this and these many steps, or like yeah, that would be great, and. Uh, but so when people do that, they still like code up that part themselves, and then they just call their script right. that they generate. Because in the end, you generate a run script, and so like you can hard code like a loop around that again. Um, but that's a bit more advanced, yeah. Kristen, you were at class. At, were you at class at the the siege? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I was like, people look familiar, but like I'm kind of like. Lost track sometimes where I met them. Cool. Yes, that's good. Is it working here? We think so. Yeah. Wiki or like just Google CSD mess. Uh, I don't like that. Do you have? I've got Google. Yeah. Um, I just. Are you connected to the web? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now so just. And I'm logged check on. I'm logged on to. You got guest. guest. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. Uh, so if I for some reason. Yeah, 
so okay, so like maybe like cut away this like main page wiki yeah. and then like fill in WMT and for me that works already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So how do I actually? So it's it, I get this. So it's just doing this like that. Hmm. And I wonder if this is a, a plug. An Internet Explorer thing. Yeah. yeah. It's a, this is I eleven I think on here. Yeah. It's just why I tried. Uh, That's why you tried Chrome, or? Yeah, so I just downloaded Chrome. It wants to do this login thing. So I've got CS. I use Chrome, so like yeah. that. I'm so pretty sure that that will work for you. This is a cool laptop. This is my own laptop. Um, so if I go into. WMT. And then, like, put in, I, I just have my Gmail. Yeah. So I got that. Let me put any password in, okay? Yeah, the first time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then I'll just sign in. Repeat your password. Okay, oh, this is better than I got last time. So okay. Good. There you go. Okay, so, good. So I also have my speech. Cool. Like so, maybe open up the example one that I'm like trying to have people do, yeah. And then, like, if you click under here, there's like this one is CM waves, emulsion, and river. Uh, yeah. So, so like now it's populated already, but you can like change whatever you want. Yeah. Once you need to log on to the. Yeah. Once you once you save this and you submit this, then like it will prompt you for it. Yeah, I think you still need to save because it's your run now as opposed to a public run. Okay. And then try to run. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why I have to close the machine down and start it again. Maybe that was, there was something like a. Well, there's things where like the browser settings don't like. Yeah. To run things or whatever. Oh yeah, sorry. I should have told you. Like you can cut it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring it back like in a second, but then, yeah. Great feedback too. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like Explorer is still have I know, I just learned that. How yeah. Because Chris had to download Chrome too. So Yeah.